From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is on an adventure, but he will be returning very soon. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Michigan Troll Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Matt, as you know, this week we're diving into something very special to both of us, the history and the future of spying. It's a long story, even if we're just treating it as a primer. And so you and I decided off air to make this a two part episode. We're spending the entirety of the week, at least episode wise, on this topic. And as you may imagine, fellow conspiracy realists, a great many parts of this story are by design lost to history because hmm. when spine works out, no one knows about it. Right. Yep. Uh, But what this will do is cause a great deal of paranoia in both us and you and everyone else. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And yet sometimes, uh, you know, the primary criticism of paranoia is that there's something inherently narcissistic about it. But being paranoid does not make you wrong, nor does it make you crazy. And you should uh, you you may indeed look at things a little bit differently after going with us on this journey, depending on, you know, where you are in your personal life. The kind of stuff you have on your phone. Let's see what else. Your political associates, your friends and family's associates. Let's see. Anywhere you've ever traveled, anything you've ever purchased, uh, anything you've said on social media, anybody who has a phone number that you used to have. We'll get into it, but there's a lot of stuff. Even stuff that you may be on track to achieve later on in life. Mm, mm -hmm. Very well said. Yes, the predictive capabilities. Uh, So first things first, uh, we need to, before we really begin, we need to bust a couple quick myths, I think. Uh, Matt, as you know, the real life of a spy is nowhere near as cool as it is uh, portrayed to be in fiction and in film, and sometimes by alleged ex-spies when they have a book deal on the way. A lot of it is like, a lot of it's paperwork, man. A lot of it's a desk job. And uh, there was one former spy, admitted former spy, who described the work as incredibly monotonous and uncommonly useless in many (laughs) cases. Well, they didn't know. They didn't know if it would be right, like useful to know where Diplomat A was going and what they were talking about. Maybe they just went to that pizza store at the same time every week because they like pizza. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. but now you know where they are if you ever need them for any reason or you need to get something from them. So I don't know. In in the end, any spy that says it's not very useful, I don't trust. There we go. (laughs) There we go. And a healthy dose of paranoia is good for the soul. And in some cases, it's good for your physical health as well. So here are the facts. We have to ask ourselves, what is a spy exactly? Because you'll notice when you see this stuff reported that perspective matters. So China will, for instance, insist they've caught a spy or like Iran caught three um, three people in their early 20s a while back crossing the border on foot. And they said, look, these folks are U.S. spies. And the U.S. said, oh, no, 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 no. They're hikers. Uh, If you remember that story, these stories pop up and they disappear in the news um, on a strange level. But at, at the most basic definition, a spy, whatever euphemism you want to use for them, is anyone who uses subterfuge to obtain information for someone else or, in the next step, to take actions that would be to the benefit of their employers or their handlers. And we'll, we'll get to the idea of handlers in a moment. But Matt, when we're talking about obtaining information, what, what do we mean exactly? Well, 
information is so many things, right? And obtaining it just means getting your eyes, ears, or some recording device to capture whatever that thing is. It could be something as little as, uh, the example here would be an itinerary for an upcoming trip or event that's going to happen. Uh, maybe seeing a list of people who will be attending said event. Maybe that's all you need for this particular thing. Maybe it's just, you know, laying out, let's say in my office right now, it was just laying out here next to my desk and someone was able to snap a photo of that thing, an itinerary. That could be very helpful. Uh, maybe it's in an email that I send out. So all you'd have to do is find a way to intercept that email or a phone conversation. It could be a meeting between two people and one of whom is a target or a party that you're interested in. Yeah. And that's, that's interesting. Uh, those two examples are a great exercise in contrast. So in the itinerary example, it could literally just be something left out on someone's desk because they were a little too nonchalant with their OPSEC. But in the second example, what I like about that is the focus may not necessarily be on the conversation. The focus might be on a high value target. And so you could get some of those off the record conversations from some VIPs that don't have state secrets, but they do put the speaker in a super uncool light. And that is very useful for later character attacks, smear campaigns, or propaganda, uh, as anybody listening to the uh, Nixon tapes would later find. Mm -hmm. Because woof, when that guy thought he was not around a hot mic, he was yeah. had some hot takes. Yeah, I mean, having, having compromise on anybody, just something that could put someone in a compromising position is very helpful for a spy. Oh, yeah. And it could also, it could also be critical information, classified stuff about new weapons, internal strategies, a nation's fears, their ambitions, and on and on. And the weird thing is, you don't see this too, too often in fiction, but the weird thing is a spy or an asset, because if they're working for you, you don't want to call them spies, an asset may not know exactly what they're getting, and they may not know why. They're just supposed to go to where half of a peanut butter sandwich is and take it and then drop that, you know, drop that SD card somewhere else. It's also not uncommon for spying operations to focus on this quickly gets in like catch 22 territory. It's not uncommon for spies to focus on the other side spying operation. That's where we get to uh, one of my favorite government phrases counterintelligence uh mirrors facing mirrors i love it endlessly <laughs> and and the funny thing about counterintelligence especially if you have learned english as a second language is it sounds like a synonym for stupid yeah it sounds like make dumb <laughs> i <laughs> that's not what it means but that's that's certainly what it sounds like and uh i i still i still crack i know counterintelligence folks and i still crack up when i hear it and uh you know they don't all think it's as funny as I do, but we have very different lives. So when we talk about how this info can be collected, you can imagine any number of possibilities and at at least some point it's probably happened in real life, you know, secret identities, cover, which as we'll find in part two, um, a secret identity or a cover ID is much more difficult to do now in the places that matter. And then you see uh, honeypot tactics. Uh, uh, by the way, that's the places that matter, I'm assuming, with regards to U.S. interests, right? Of uh, Like the places that we would want as a country to be in? Or is that what you mean? I would, I would say the weird thing is that globally speaking, a lot of intelligence agencies are at least currently focused on the same general yeah. regions. OK, right. cool. So if there's something and it may not be for a given nation's particular domestic interest, like, like I assure you, if uh, SIGINT signals intelligence indicates to Russia that the U.S. is for some reason getting super into Peru, then they're going to make sure they have some folks in Peru just to figure out what's going on. Got it. And and you can mislead people. It becomes a grand rabbit chase. Or uh, what was what was that thing they used to call it here in the U.S.? A snipe hunt. 
it becomes a snipe hunt to find the missing thing. But uh, Matt, will you you want to talk to us a little bit about uh, honey pot tactics or honey oh. traps? Oh, those are my favorite. Oh, my gosh. Those they're are my favorite. They're everybody's favorite. <laughs> Until the very end, they're everybody's favorite. <laughs> Except maybe the trapper. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, that would be someone using coercive techniques to get very, very, very close to someone. Uh, let's just put it like that. There's also, you know, blackmail. They could come out of that. And blackmail... Honeypots and blackmail really go well together, I think. That's a match made in... Uh, an undisclosed location. There you go. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, a honeypot uh, describes describes weaponized seduction, essentially. Yeah. And it's happening now as we record this episode. It does inevitably lead to its uglier cousin, blackmail, as you said, Matt. Um, and then sometimes you can just skip the honeypot and you can just threaten people or you can just misrepresent something in order to acquire information. Then, of course, the real movie stuff is like infiltration. Oh, no. It turns out that Johnny P. America is not actually American. And he's been, you know, that's where you get the lines where like someone, someone finds out and they're like, oh, what? You were at my daughter's wedding. Yeah. And, and they're like, Nostrovia, bro. <laughs> but the, the list goes on, you know? Uh, like if you if you just made up if you just made up a scenario vaguely, like a plot line to how info could be collected, uh it it probably has been collected that way. Up to and including like going through trash and painstakingly pasting together stuff from a shredder. It's it's nuts. But that's all. A lot of that can just be passive action. Just like you said, just snapping a little photo of a piece of paper on a table. And that's still, I imagine, very stressful for the people involved. But but what happens when we go beyond the passive? What happens when we get to the <laughs> the spy hits the fans moment? What would we call that? Oh, like... um the actions like taking action discrete action that kind of like thing i i i don't know uh like, moving from clandestine observance to covert activity right? there we go that's what it is okay yes and this is dude you can do so much stuff here um if we're talking about collecting evidence you can also plant things right you can put stuff yes. where it's going to be found maybe in a place where it feels like oh Oh, I've stumbled upon this th the secret thing that I'm not supposed to have, but now I have it, and now I can use it. But you can do a lot of stuff with that intelligence too. Talking about disinfo here, misinfo, things you could do to really stir the enemy's pot, whoever that enemy is. Um, full on sabotage, like destroying equipment or a system that's needed to to have some goal achieved by the opposition, or uh, even assassinations. Like th this is where you see stuff happening. There's a story that came out not long ago where Mossad assassinated an Iranian nuclear scientist when they were not in the country and they did it with a remote controlled machine gun. Insane. It's real. You can look up that story and find it. Yes, it's a true story. And typically when you hear about something go... <laughs> If you're listening to this and you're not involved in that community, when you hear about an assassination at all, it's because either something went wrong or because someone very much wants you to know. Mm -hmm. Like those those anonymous sources who talked <laughs> in the New York Times or whatever, they are sanctioned. They're allowed to say that. It's it's kind of um they're uh it, it's kind of a a a flex. Like how Russia used polonium on purpose because they could deny it all the live long day, but polonium poisoning is kind of an autograph, you know, it's a little, a little a signature, right? So, they didn't so, want us to know about the whole underwear poisoning of Navalny, but they did want, I think they wanted us to know about the polonium. Yes, agreed. Uh, and when we look at, when we look at fiction and pop culture and we hear about spies and espionage, 
it's almost always going to be focused on state-level spying, right? Someone in country A has been sent to country B to learn about something country B doesn't want you to know. But in practice, espionage, if you define it as just like a set of tactics, it exists at every single level of society. Corporations are participating in industrial espionage right now. Domestic political campaigns, without, by the way, the approval of the big guys, are also participating in similar operations. And if you hop on Twitter right now, you'll find all these numerous accounts of people accusing each other of tactics like spying. But they we usually instead call those disinfo campaigns stuff like spreading rumors or gossip. Because people's lives aren't on the line. It's just that you don't like that, you know, you don't like that your internet friend said one thing here and then said another thing later. But that's still, that's still misdirection. And it's because of one thing, one thing they all have in common, all of these situations. Secrecy. Secrecy is inherent to all these activities, and the hard truth of the world is that secrets have an inherent power, which means that so long as secrets exist, human beings are going to con- attempt to control them for their own end, either disclosing them, either disguising them, or either confusing them. And that's, it's, when you think of it that way, it's pretty astonishing how long spying has been around. I don't think it's the oldest profession, but it's in like the top 10 because it's been around ever since the first civilization wanted to learn what the second civilization was up to, I would say, you know. Or since there was someone with sufficient power and control over a, you know, a society, no matter how large or small, and wanted to know what people who oppose them were doing. Right. Even if they're within their own community or village or town or castle or society for podcast network. Yes. Uh, uh. <laughs> so uh, we're going to pause for a second because we have to we have to redact the next part of this podcast, go off air and, and figure out a few things. But we'll be back after a word from our sponsors. Okay, Matt, I I think we got it sorted. What do you think? Yeah, sure. We got it sorted, Ben. It was always Jonathan Strickland. Shh, dude. Don't say his name. We've learned that. (laughs) That's a different show. (laughs) Oh, you're right. Oh, sorry. You're right. Yeah, Uh, it was Jonathan. It was Jonathan. (laughs) Yeah, it it was him the whole time. I mean, he hosts tech stuff. But yes, this is... This is crazy when we talk about how old espionage tactics are. It turns out that one of the earliest, we would call it classified today, one of the earliest classified documents in history dates all the way back to the time of Hammurabi. And it's a, it's a, it's a letter from a spy who is disguised as a diplomatic employee, a diplomatic envoy, and he's reporting back in secret to the king. And Hammurabi, just for reference, uh, I think he died around like 1750 BCE or so. That was the end of his reign. Uh, And if you go back to, what, the 4th century BCE, then you see the oft-quoted military genius Sun Tzu talking about the importance of military intelligence in, you know, the book that so many people quote, The Art of War. Oh, yes. And within that tome that is in every rapper's <laughs> bookshelf, no, <I'm> just joking. <laughs> at least the no, cool ones, the ones that true. I like, <laughs> um, <laughs> he talks about, or it, let's say he categorizes a lot of the different things that, that modern spies do. And it's really interesting to see it written out from way back then. And this is this is stuff talking about someone acting as an informant who is just listening in, let's say, has some information, is able to share it with you. The penetration agent. Hmm, now, that sounds dirty. Not as dirty as it seems. <laughs> <laughs> this is somebody who go who actually is working on the other side, right? Pretending to function as 
and operative for your, for your enemies. There's also the disinfo agent. You know, this is the person who's going to distribute information that is incorrect or false on purpose to confuse your enemies. And there's so much more in that oh, book. Yeah. And, and none of these, uh, he, he doesn't use any of these terms, to mm. be clear. These are, these are broad categories we would use in the modern day. And also, any person working in these sorts of fields is not going to have it on their LinkedIn. <laughs> or at least if they do, they're not going to be doing this for a very long time. I love the idea. Uh, here's my card, Matt Frederick. I'm a penetration, penetration agent. agent. Wink. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we penetrating today? Right? Uh, Enron. Wait, what, what year is it? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We can talk about Enron now. I thought you did great work there. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so Sun Tzu also notes the importance of counterintelligence and the danger of double agents, which gets so confusing so quickly. Everything he mentions in this regard remains relevant in the modern day thousands of years later. So we're going to give him, Paul, I don't know where our sound cue is here, but we're going to give Sun Tzu an official not bad award. Good job. <laughs> Good job, dude. Oh, man. <laughs> not bad, dude. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. It's not the, you know, it's not the vaunted great work or, you know, we can't. Well, great work is something different for mm. us on this show, but, mm -hmm. we, you know, we don't give that award out often. Anyway, as you know, he's not the only guy who's thinking along these lines. We can laundry list ancient kingdoms that all had something like spies, even if they were not codified or organized into a network that was meant to last through like um, through multiple kings or multiple reigns or dynasties. We know ancient Egypt had spies. Ancient kingdoms in India had spies and they had counterintelligence. And the, the, these two in particular worked assiduously to maintain this. In ancient Egypt, pharaohs would call these folks the eyes and the ears of the pharaoh. I would even posit that the importance of espionage, spying, and counterintelligence was so well known to human civilization that it made it into some mythology. Like consider Odin's two ravens, thought and memory, and he sends them out to just tell them, you know, what's going on. And uh, that, to me, doesn't come from nowhere. Uh, we also know it's common in other empires across the world. Yeah, this is also common in Greek, Roman, Mongol, and the Japanese empires, all those places. And you can even look to the Bible and find a few spy stories. Uh, there's a tale about this fellow Rahab, uh, you ever heard of this? I, I don't really remember this at all, but it's essentially spies that were sent to Jericho and they were sent there before there was going to be an attack. And the whole point was to get an idea of what's the enemy doing. How, like how many troops are there? Where are they stationed? Where are the weak points where we could actually infiltrate and, and make this thing way more effective? Um, it's one of the earliest written records of a, let's say, successful espionage attempt. Yeah, in this story, Joshua secretly sends two spies to, I believe the quote is, look over the land, but especially Jericho. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and it was successful because Rahab, she had, she had hidden these two spies away. So she actually misdirected authorities of Jericho when they were trying to find the spies. And she said, she, uh, uh it's, I want to be clear, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, she essentially said when the cops rocked up to her, they went that away. <laughs> that's that's kind of what happened. So we know that it's existed for a long time. It's in one of the most popular books in human civilization. And often these operations falter and cease when the various empires fail or the various rulers fall out of favor. But the more conspiratorial in the crowd today will maybe point to evidence of former state movements that go rogue, like the Knights Templar. Uh, when they go rogue and fall out of favor, spycraft becomes not just a tool in the toolbox, but it becomes a necessity for survival going forward. 
And this, this is an amazing, like, long period of history. We're just establishing that it's been around a long, long time. It is a very old, oft-hidden tradition. But we do know a little bit more about spying in the Middle Ages, and we know even more about spying in the Cold War era, comparatively at least. Again, a lot of this, by design, is lost to history. Uh, And I guess we should say, to be fair, in the intelligence community, people don't like the term spycraft. It's Mm. a little contentious. You got to call it tradecraft, which I... I understand, you know, the rationale behind euphemisms or whatever, but tradecraft feels a little, I don't want to be disrespectful. It just feels like it's so vague that we're all just pretending to use this word without describing what it actually is. Yeah, I agree. And also I wrote out spycraft in my notes app over here and I stylized it like spacecraft (laughs) and I want to play that game. So I just wish Blizzard was in better, you know, standing so that they could make a game called Spycraft. Oh, and I found a uh, pretty cool game you can play online if you will. We'll tell you how to get to it. A pretty cool spy game you can play online if you go to hq.everydayspy.com. I was scared to click on it, Ben. (laughs) Serious. It's called Operation Real Time. Uh, mm-mm. no not getting my email address <laughs> <laughs> i like the way you're thinking i do like the way you're thinking here so let's maybe just talk about some examples from the middle ages so the english queen elizabeth the first from 1533 1603 uh, she established or her court established what people today recognize as the first long-term dedicated intelligence network. And over in France, the infamous Cardinal Richelieu, 1585-1642, used something he called the Cabinet Noir to monitor all, all correspondence of foreign diplomats and then also to keep tabs on anybody he suspected of treason. Yeah, and, and this, this, this is reading of letters. That's what this is. It's yes. go into a black cabinet. You take the letters in there. You open them up a little bit, just really carefully, or use some light and read what's in there, and then put them back, and then just send it on off to where it's supposed to go. Right. Put that little wax seal back mm-hmm. perfectly so no mm-hmm. one can tell the letter was opened. And there was also a postal intelligence network that reached its glory days in Vienna in uh, 1716 through 1848 was called the Secret Cipher Chancellery, which does sound like a cool group of people to freestyle with, but <laughs> but, yeah. they're, but they're, uh, no, they're just reading the mail as well. Somehow and, it uh, takes us back to rap, though. What is, uh, I don't know what this is, Ben, but what is a cipher, uh, like, when with regards to freestyle? What is a cipher? I don't know what that is. So, typically, um, a lot of things can be referred to as a cipher. A cipher can be a battle, or a battle can be a kind of cipher. Uh, won't deploy the maze puzzle comparison just yet. But in a in a cipher, you're not necessarily battling people. You okay. might just be hanging out and trading verses. Uh, and, you know, often, sadly, those verses are now sort of pre-written and memorized and just recited it could be considered a freestyle because someone hasn't heard the beat before or because they're going a cappella. But that's so a cipher is you, you're not necessarily fighting someone. It's like you, me, Paul, and you listening along at home. We all, we're all gathered around somewhere and we're just. It's a display spin. of skills without the need to have an opponent. Right. Without the need to have a specific opponent. It's hmm. still, it's, there's still, you know, a lot of like braggadocio with a formula of a these people are bad b i'm good c here's why okay got it etc got it well, well hey the more you know thanks ben. the more you know <laughs> thanks matt anyway back in the day in the days of antiquity the old school spying days before anybody had ever heard of the nsa or sigint the spies of ancient days came from specialized parts of their various class systems. 
And they could be they could be things like members of the upper class. Very, very valuable. If you want to know what's going on in Bavaria and you have someone who is tight with the rulers of Bavaria and hangs out with them in court, then that's that's worth a thousand just middle class people. And if you because they have access to restricted areas and restricted conversations, restricted people, this is ultimately all about access and leverage. That's right. And what's also sometimes equally effective is having people who are on staff in a palace, right? Or a, a governor's mansion, something to that effect. Because they may also have access to those restricted areas because they have to clean them or serve drinks in there. Very, very smart move uh, to, to do if you're, if you're ever, you know, running a spy network. And they get ignored too, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I'm always, not to get too far behind the curtain, but one of the things that I suggest you always do if you are in a new environment and you're going to be there for some amount of time is, like, a lot of, a lot of people who see themselves as networkers or social climbers mess up because they try to make friends with people they envision at the top of a hierarchy, Right. And sometimes they get unethical and they try to take credit for other people's work and blah, 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 blah. But they've got it all back ass words because what you should be doing is you should be befriending and building rapport, not with just those folks, but with the folks who are always there, with security, with the people in maintenance. And those, those are the folks who will tend to know more of the day-to-day -day than the average person. And you can siphon all kinds of information out of them. <laughs> And yes, yes. And in some cases, as sad as it is to admit with the way humans let themselves be ruled by hierarchies rather than abilities, in some cases, you can just treat someone like a human being. And that alone will be enough, uh, even if even if they're telling you stuff they know they shouldn't be saying. Anyway, you're right. And this stuff continues to the modern day, this access uh, this idea of leveraging hierarchy, this idea of leveraging advantage. Uh, academia, elite universities, they are breeding grounds across the world for potential assets. Um, take, for instance, the Cambridge Five. They fed information to the Soviets from the United Kingdom in World War II. And U.S. intelligence agencies also actively recruit from elite universities. As we'll learn later, going to college uh, is kind of a requirement if you want to be if you want to be considered for some of the less unpleasant espionage roles. And there are plenty of unpleasant ones we'll get to. I'm so excited about part two already. Okay, so this is interesting. This next thing, we're still back in the day. If let's say you can't get you, you've tried and you've tried and tried, and you just can't get someone inside the court of your adversary. The next best thing you do is get tight with someone who's a member of a class that has an access to a wide array of information. This is where, like, our royal staff comes in. This is also where successful traveling merchants or big-time business members come in because they are able— they're some of the first people in human history who were able to see what you would call the 40,000-foot view. They could see the forest. They knew that insert country here is getting a lot more gunpowder than they used to. They knew, you know, they could see these movements. Um, in the old days, there would be a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of attention put on how much food someone was storing. Right. And if it's if it's an out of season thing, why are their reserves so high in a time of plenty? Why are they saving all that? And where would they if they were going to lay siege to something? It would be their draft pick. Oh my merchants, gosh. merchants will know that kind of stuff. And for the right price or for the right ideology, they would disclose it. So they had knowledge of inter-civilizational trade in times when many people lived and died within 30 miles of where they were born. So this occurs today, even on a, I would say, on a more accelerated scale, because Matt, as you and I know, and we're sometimes in a bubble, folks, sometimes we don't know what is like normal to know but but as as you and i know 
And as I hope everybody knows, states and corporations have reached an entirely new level of intertwinement, I would mm. say, right? That's a great way to put it. And the, the power is shifting or even has shifted in an interesting way as, as those things intertwine and weave together. The the power kind of it, oh the power kind of flows through it as one system now rather than the government empowering the corporate structures or the you know in the future I think the corporate structures allowing the governments to exist oh sorry yeah no no <laughs> you're right everybody's longtime listeners have heard the theory of this right the human evolution human social evolution proceeds like this one you got the family. Two, you've got the tribe. Three, you've got the religion, right? That is the rationale or the belief system uniting disparate tribes, uniting disparate families. And then four, you've got the state. And then five, the level we're going to now is the corporate governance. You know, like the, there's a great sci-fi novel called like the United States, a subsidiary of Exxon, stuff like that. We're, we're very much on the way there. Shout out to uh, those new tech companies plans for company towns that worked out so well in the coal mining days, didn't it? <laughs> it's so, oh, no. I know. Sorry. These are unnecessary pot shots. I don't need to walk so far away down the street just to talk trash about, it. but company towns are a terrible idea. Uh, Let's talk about <laughs> Tesla. Anyway, continue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about another another social class we haven't really named yet, Matt. Uh, what would our third great demographic for a spy be in the in, back in the day? Yes, Ben. A great example is one of the things you've just mentioned. One of those classes, the religious class. So anyone who is in charge of a flock of people, like minded individuals who all worship the same deity. Uh, if you can somehow infiltrate that system and get, let's say, a Catholic priest on your side, get a pastor of a very large megachurch on your side, and this person can either disseminate information out to the people that they have access to, or they can gather information pretty easily. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, think about it. In in days when uh, the average person struggled with literacy or couldn't read at all, we're talking about people who are polyglots. They can decipher things written in foreign languages. They have the power of literacy and they tend to have control over other people due to those religious beliefs. This isn't always a bad thing, but it's not always a good thing when you consider stuff like the Catholic Church's role in assisting Nazis and fascists during World War II, uh, back when it wasn't a hot take to say that fascism is a bad thing, which yeah. it is. Anyway, you're right, well, Matt. We yeah, well, it's the same thing. If you, if you imagine, I don't know, let's say you're – in Baghdad or something, if you can gain sway over a an imam that's the head of a mosque in a strategic location, that can be very, very helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. And multiple people will try, even today. So we could spend hours examining known feats of intelligence operatives in the Middle East and early Western Europe. We could look at all the weird, weird ideas the USSR and the U.S. cooked up during the Cold War. And folks, fellow conspiracy realists, if you're interested, uh, I think, Matt, you and I are, are happy to explore more specific ideas in the future. But we already know, despite being a two-parter, we're running a little long with this. So we'll just say, if you want to learn more, check out our episodes on, like, non-human spy ideas. Uh, check out our episodes on the, the Culper Ring, Agent 355, who remains unidentified in the modern day. For now, main takeaway is this. Spying is ancient. It predates the creation of the Bible, and it's likely been around as long as civilizations have. So our question, what is the world of tradecraft like in the modern day? We're going to pause for another redaction, and we'll be back to explore that together. Here's where it gets crazy. The telegraph, the oh. telephone, <laughs> the moving <laughs> photography. <laughs> it's the 19th century. We're boldly going into the future and spying is coming along. That's the only 
transatlantic I'll do. I know that can get grating after a while. Uh, that's okay. I love it. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we were talking about the information age kind of beginning to bloom, right? I mean, be, being able to just communicate with somebody from a vast distance changes spycraft completely. Yeah. And there's there's not really an argument that human spies and intelligence agencies found themselves kind of in a John Henry situation. Uh, in the modern day, they became less relevant as electronic sources could replace some of the old trat and true skullduggery. But maybe the most surprising part of, and we'll call it tradecraft, maybe the most surprising part of tradecraft today is that on some level, the majority of all those old school analog techniques are still in use today all around the world. Dead drops, fake identities, cover stories, false info, all that stuff is still around. And it might seem counterintuitive at first because electronic surveillance has become this eye of Sauron that can sweep the world. And for the sake of either ignorance or convenience, most civilians seem fine ratting on themselves through smartphones, social media, GPS, etc. So the question is, why would you need human operators out there risking their lives for those old, with those old school methods of information disruption or retrieval. Short answer, eh, it works. It still yeah. works. That's a reason like cars still have wheels because wheels work. You know what yeah. I mean? We can well, build better <laughs> wheels, but there's still wheels. Yeah, you're correct. Uh, I would just give a quick example. And I think we're going to do this, Ben, but if I take a picture with my phone and even if it's just Let's say I've turned off everything on this okay. phone, right? right? Yeah. My, uh, there's no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth. I'm not even connected to LTE or anything like that. Turn it all off. I still take a photo with this. There, it is much easier to get onto this phone and get what I have captured than it would be if I have, let's say, a camera that has film in it that you can't access by any digital means. I click a button, it gets exposed, I develop it myself, and then I deliver it at some drop where it needs to go. There's no way for anyone to know that I've done that unless they are physically watching me through some other probably digital means. Right, right, exactly. It can stop newer operations in their tracks. It can stop things like hacking or signals intelligence, SIGINT, which is kind of the future of spying. But it, yeah, just I picked up my phone to mm -hmm. talk about that and give that example. And I got I just got a call from an unknown number. So great. Okay, cool. <laughs> we redacted everything. Just to be clear, everything we're talking about is declassified too, by the way. So this eliminating a digital footprint is the most successful step a modern spy can take to avoid discovery because it's one of the first steps a counterintelligence agency will take in the identification of any operation. And the digital world of spying definitely exists and modern on the ground assets do use it. We've got some check out our Lake City Quiet Pills conversations to learn more about how you can communicate with people in source code or think about um think about how one of the best ways to leverage online communication is to blend in just like an old school spy would blend into a crowd, you blend into maybe nonsensical comments on YouTube pages. And nobody knows that, like, if you're looking at, what's the last example used for, like, you're looking at a old, um, an, an old clip from a three dog night live show. Hmm. And then you drop a comment on there that is meant for one person and doesn't make sense for anybody else. That's a very effective way of doing it. No, I mean, I've got somebody on our YouTube channel that just says corking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wonder what that's about, spy. I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> right. So also, unless you're in a really heavily monitored police state like the DPRK or North Korea, or you're in a really sensitive area like downtown D.C. or something, dead drops and chance meetings still work really well. The stuff that we would call old school spy craft or trade craft is now often collectively called clandestine hume int. H-U-M-I-N-T, talked about before, human intelligence. SIGINT 
is passive signals collection, sort of reading the tea leaves of all those messages that everybody sends to each other from the innocuous um, likes on an Instagram page uh, to to bigger stuff like diplomatic cables, et cetera, uh, energy signatures, that kind of that kind of stuff. Human, conversely, is collecting intelligence from human sources using those old cloak and dagger techniques. We can talk just really quickly about how what kind of role humans can play in this regard. There's the basic spy, but again, if they're working with you, you never call them spies. If they're working with you, in fact, you don't talk about them. <laughs> they're your girlfriend that goes to another school, and you don't really you don't bring it up. But uh, if you do have to talk, then the nomenclature is something more like asset or agent, right? And sometimes very secretive um, very secretive operations, then you're not going to use those words either because they're a dead giveaway that you're talking about a spy. You know what I mean? If you're yeah. learning this on a podcast, imagine what the professionals are thinking if they stumble across something that references an asset in Tehran. Uh-uh, tut-tut. So, <laughs> so we know, no, this is another thing. Like we know that for every, say, soldier in an in a typical conflict, you have a larger number of support staff that are enabling that person, whether they are an actual soldier or a mercenary or I think warfighter is the euphemism now in the age of privatized militaries. They they all have a support staff and spies aren't really any different. Oh, yeah. Well, let's say you are going old school and trying to get rid of that digital signature in your communications. One of the best things you can do is have a human being physically get your communication and take it to the person you mean for that communication to get to. Uh, that's a courier. Couriers are all over the place. In Atlanta, do you remember, Ben, we were at our old offices, how often couriers would show up at our offices and how often we would send for a courier? Yes. I feel like that doesn't happen as much now. Now, well, now it's the gig economy. Wait a minute. Um, I'm having... I'm having some kind of breakthrough, but I'm going to save it for later. Okay. That's not the only <laughs> kind of person. You've also got, um, oh, this is great. Like, we're talking about handlers, right? That's one one thing. But then there's also access agents. And these are also gatekeepers in a lot of way, uh, in a lot of ways, where if something goes really bad with you as an on-the-ground agent or someone that's working for you, an on-the-ground agent, um, you get burned, your identity gets known, these access agents kind of function as this air gap between the spy and the rest of the major operation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, if spy gets burned, excuse me, asset gets burned, uh, <laughs> access, it goes, it trails all the information trails back to that access agent. And hopefully that's where everything ends if you're doing it right. Yeah. And this is also, uh, this is also sometimes called a cut, a cutout. Mm. So, yeah, they're, they're a human air gap. They're a human fire break. And this is because uh, the hope is that if, if the asset is burned, then, you know, worse comes to worse and they disclose information, the case officer will still be able to get away and the trail will go cold before it reaches the actual employee. Uh, so... Uh, also, we should say a lot of this terminology that you hear is is often outdated because, again, in internal documentation, it's a dead giveaway of what's going on, and you don't want people to know what's going on. What is a case officer? They recruit or they manage the asset, and those functions Matt and I just described, they're not always separate, uh, and they don't always follow a pattern because a pattern is predictable and using the same template over and over again can lead to trouble down the road. It's the last so, thing you want to do. It's the last thing you want to do. So if this were a nature documentary, David Attenborough would describe, well, actually, you've got a pretty good David Attenborough voice, Matt. Human intelligence is the natural enemy of counterintelligence. The two operations have diametrically oppositional goals, and this line can get weirdly muddled as various agents get turned, and in some cases, turned again, and then again, 
and again until they've gone full rogue or meet the all-too-common end for an asset, death, or capture. Right, right. Neither particularly pleasant. Also, <laughs> thank you. So, so most sides in an espionage conflict, which is always occurring, which is happening right now, even with countries that say they are friendly, all the most sides don't really have laws against their guys doing something. Like assassination, espionage is a covert pursuit. It's an ugly open secret in the halls of diplomacy. Instead, they have laws against other people, anyone else doing it. So in the good old U.S. of A., espionage is a violation of technically 18 code 18 USA Code 792-798 and Article 106 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The U.S. has their definition of what espionage is. It's the act of obtaining, delivering, transmitting, communicating, or receiving information about the national defense with an intent or reason to believe this information may be used to the injury of the United States or to the advantage of any foreign nation. So it's kind of like a I'm rubber, you're glue situation. You know what I mean? Or rules for thee, but not for me. Uh, <laughs> every nation kind of has something like this. It is also extremely, extremely rare for any country to make a public comment about their own activities, but they will readily and gleefully snitch on someone else if they've caught them with a shadowy hand in the cookie jar. So, yeah, and yet all of these countries still allow diplomats into their midst and embassies. Mm -hmm. Man. <laughs> I know, I know. And don't get us started on diplomatic pouches. <laughs> but it's like, it's a, it's a necessary thing. Everybody has sort of collectively agreed at this point in human civilization that it's better to have diplomats because it can help make the world the one thing most world leaders want it to be, which is more predictable and uh, less unstable. Notice I didn't say totally stable because... Mm. Unfortunately, for a lot of players, chaos is an opportunity. Like Littlefinger said in uh, Song of Ice and Fire, chaos is a ladder. Mm. Much harder to extract resources when everything is stable. I know, right? Jeez. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's where we're at. This is, this is our close of part one. The history of tradecraft and the present remains a closely guarded secret for a lot of nations. It's a game of smoke and mirrors with the mirrors, as you said, Matt, facing one another. And it becomes so complex sometimes that it's difficult to know who is actually working for whom and what their end game in actuality is. Now, part of that's due to the cell structure of most of these operations. A cell structure is like, let's say, let's say, Paul Deccant is our case officer. Mm -hmm. And Matt and I, you and I are both assets, but we don't know each other. We both live in, you know, Pittsburgh or Tel Aviv or uh, Santiago or wherever, but we've never met or we've met and we don't know that we're, uh, you know, spy coworkers. That's it. We don't know that we both work for Paul and right. Paul has us both spying on each other. <laughs> yes, yeah, to keep us in line, right? And uh, yeah. th this is important because most people, uh, and this is tragic, but most people under the right circumstances will eventually disclose any information they possess if it means they can avoid death or maybe more importantly, the death of a loved one, or if they can just avoid the pain of further torture, excuse us, enhanced interrogation. So... <clears throat> Yeah, right. So that's our look at that's, – that's our brief intro to the history and some of the present complications of spying, of espionage, of tradecraft. And what we're going to do now is uh, pause, try our best to make sure our assets don't get burned, and return for part two when we take a closer look at the future of tradecraft and how people become spies in the first place. Ooh. Are we going to get into those Moscow rules? We could talk Moscow, yeah. Oh, man, I love those Moscow rules. I can't wait for that. Okay. Um, yeah, tell us what you think. L let us know if you've got maybe a family history with the trade. Be careful. 
to disguise your voice and or name and or any other information if you send anything to us, but we would love to hear your stories and your thoughts. You can reach us on social media. We are Conspiracy Stuff on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. We Also on Facebook, we have Here's Where It Gets Crazy, a great place where you can go and meet other like-minded conspiracy realists and have discussions about this and any of the other topics that we've covered. And if you don't care for social media or your current cover ID doesn't allow for it, we totally get it. You can give us a call directly and speak to us through your mouth. Uh, our number is one eight three three std wytk Three minutes. Those three minutes are yours. Give yourself an amazing nickname or just one that you like. Tell us what's on your mind. Uh, the second most important thing about your call is to let us know if it's okay to use your name and voice on the air. The number one most important thing is not to censor yourself. If you have a story that deserves more than three minutes, if you have links you want to send, if you have some pictures you'd like us to take a gander at, uh, we read every single email we get. All you have to do is shoot us a line where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.